Hi, um, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from the UK, so I've come over the pond. And it's been a really fantastic meeting, really interesting uh, for me. Um, I'm a general surgeon, so I have trained first in medicine and did my MD. And I then went to specialize in breast cancer. And during that training, became really fascinated by tumor immunology. So decided to take a plunge and go back into the lab, um, hit that learning curve. And I want to talk to you today about why I think the regulation of monocytes in breast cancer is really interesting. And um, I'm kind of backed up nicely by Joe Gray on uh, Monday, which was really nice, when he showed that fantastic video image of these tumor cells surrounded by these um, in, in infiltrate of immune cells. And um, unfortunately, he emphasized the fibroblasts, but I'd like to tell you that actually, if you ask TACMAC and the like, these are actually macrophages. But thankfully, Joe's not here to defend that. <laughs> so I can get away with that. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about that today. It's going to be slightly different to a lot of the other presentations. There are no karyotype imaging. Um, and I hope it's not too patronizing. So first of all, um, I work in mice. And most people in this room are more interested in humans. So just to recap on mice, there are two populations of monocytes. And they are marked by this marker, Lysic-C, which is we can use on flow cytometry, for example. And obviously, I'm not interested in curing mouse cancer. So fortunately, there are parallel populations in humans by the markers CD14 and CD16. And this is really important because they have completely different roles. So the um, Lysic C high and the CD14, which are around 85% to 90% in humans, actually are released in response to inflammation. So they rely on CCL2, which causes their release from the bone marrow. And then they travel to the tissue where they extravasate and form macrophages and dendritic cells. Some really nice, um, very eloquent in, vi in vivo imaging has shown that actually the non-classical um, monocytes actually sort of roll along the endothelial wall. And they adhere using CX3CL1, um, CX3CR, um, CL1 axis. And um, they are basically patrolling, looking for any um, damage to the endothelium, and actually involved in resolution. They're extremely hard to track because there are very few of them. Um, and they also stick to the endothelium. So um, my professor actually confessed to me that um, some 30 years ago, they used to swing the mice around the room to release the monocytes. Um, we're not allowed to do that. So um, no disclosures on animal work here. Um, so moving on, why am I interested in monocytes in cancer? Well, the image that, that Joe Gray showed us on uh, Monday really nicely showed the milieu of immune cells that form around these tumors in, in every solid tumor environment. So not just in breast, but also pancreatic or um, particularly melanoma, um, but also colon cancer and many others. So monocytes are really interesting because they have a kind of dual role. And they're actually the cell that are recruited to form tumor-associated macrophages. And as we've heard, things like PDL1 um, are used to um, suppress T cell killing. But these cells are also important in terms of matrix remodeling. They support the angiogenesis that occurs. And ultimately, some, some really eloquent um, imaging has shown that they actually punch holes in the, in the endothelial wall and allow for intravasation and ultimately spread of the tumor. Um, more recently, our lab have shown that they're actually necessary for the establishment of metastases. And this is not actually a, a, what we call a metastases-associated macrophage, but a pre-macrophage, early kind of monocyte-differentiated cell um, that if we block, we can actually prevent metastatic seeding. So really um, key in terms of trying to solve what actually kills our patients in terms of metastases. So we could just knock out these monocytes, and that has been tried, and there has been some success. But as you can imagine, or as you all know, especially people who deal with things like maybe the, the leukemias, knocking out someone's entire monocyte population is not a great idea. Um, and so, so how do we, wh why is this not also a great idea in cancer more specifically? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that there are two different populations. And actually, we think it's the Lysic C high population that are responsible for this tumor-associated and metastases 
metastases associated macrophages. And actually, the Lysic-C low um, in uh, Lysic-C low specific mice has been shown to protect against metastases. Just to emphasize here, that has not been shown in humans yet. The population are only about 5 to 10 percent, but they do seem to expand in humans. The ratio changes. So I want to bring up this uh, idea of rather than knocking out cells, can we actually utilize those cells? And this is a common theme in um, immunotherapy and cancer. Can we actually tilt the balance? Because at the moment, we know that this pro-cancer phenotype actually dominate, dominates, and I'll return to this at the very end. So what do we know about transcriptional alterations in monocytes already. Well, what I'm showing you here is a heat map um, from our lab, and the term TMO is basically just tumor-educated monocyte. So these are just patients who have cancer. This is breast cancer, but we have similar data in endometrial and ovarian cancer, and there's similar microarray data in colorectal and renal cell ca cancer that show that essentially if you isolate monocytes, and this is just whole monocytes, this is not splitting them up into different populations, you see a transcriptional shift in these cells. So when I first saw this, I was extremely interested, and I thought, wow, that's cool. We should have a look at that. So rather than going from mouse to human, as we do in a lot of drug studies, I wanted to actually reverse this and go from the human into the mouse and try and find out if we could use mice then to better understand what was actually happening. Um, humans don't really appreciate if we go and frequently kill them and take blood and stuff, so mice was a bit more appropriate. Um, so to do that, I needed to first um, find a good mouse model, which is um, challenging, and we spent quite some time. And in the end, we went for um, the PYMT model. This is a model that's actually developed in Harvard here in America um, by Muller and colleagues in 1988. The reason this um, is such a nice model is because, firstly, it's spontaneous, which makes it nice in terms of being relevant um, and not great in terms of um, actually the practicalities, but that's fine. We can deal with that. But as you see, it really nicely um, reflects the evolution of ductal carcinoma in humans. So you go from having this um, hyperplastic lesion through to adenoma, early carcinoma, and late carcinoma. And you can see on the H&E staining that that's nicely reflected. You get the same cellular morphology, but also from a biomarker profile. These, um, these mice um, develop metastatic disease in, in terms of lung um, metastases, um, and they can develop tumors anywhere from around 16 weeks old to around 22 weeks old. Um, the progression of their tumors is um, very variable. It has um, a much more resistant phenotype on a different mouse background. So we work on a black six background, which allows us for a lot longer time to track, but also means that these are six month long um, experiments in terms of tracking these mice. So we went for this model after validating uh, a few other ones as well and trying some allograft models. And um, what we wanted to check, first of all, was um, is there a monopoiesis? Uh, when does this occur? And is it population specific? So we did flow cytometry. Um, we bled these mice every two weeks, um, tracking tumor development. And then using a quantification method, using one, two, three counting beads, we um, counted the, uh, the number of monocytes in the blood. And what you see here is that basically there is a significant expansion of monocytes by late cancer. And if I showed you the kinetic throughout the time, you'll see that this is a gradual expansion, obviously, um, but, but highly significant by late tumor stage. And just to give you an idea of what these, the mice are like at that stage, they have huge, huge tumors. They're sort of wobbling around the cage. And I wasn't terribly excited by this finding because when you dissect them, they have a big necrotic mass. But I'll go back to that a bit later. We also see um, an expansion of total bone marrow cells, which is nearly twofold. But interestingly, um, we didn't see a change in the ratios. What you see here on the top is the, the blood, and on the bottom is the bone um, in different Lysic C populations. And then I've just included some progenitor cells. So these are, these are um, just monocyte progenitors in the bone marrow that we can identify. And we were expecting that maybe the Lysic C high would be expanded in cancer um, compared with the Lysic C low, and actually the ratio was unchanged. 
Moving on, um, we needed to check is the proliferation release and survival of monocytes altered. There was a lot of suggestion in the literature that perhaps outside steady state, the um, survival of these monocytes is altered. And a seminal paper by um, Simon Yona um, had showed a really eloquent technique using BRDU. So sorry to patronize anyone, but for anyone who doesn't know, otherwise the next slides won't make any sense. BRDU is a thymidine analog, so it incorporates into any proliferating cell. And the reason it's perfect for monocytes is because they proliferate in the bone marrow. Um, they don't proliferate in the blood, and we did have to validate that in cancer that doesn't occur, obviously. They then move into the blood as lysic C high, and as they differentiate into lysic C low, we can track these being released into the blood and then eventually leaving the blood. So we did this in, <clears throat> in our mice um, with late cancer. And as expected, and this was one of the nicest experiments in my PhD, actually, because um, it reproduced every time, um, and it really matched what was in the data. So um, I was pretty happy, actually. Um, and this really closely reflects what was published by Simon Yona, which is that these um, lysic C high cells are released around 24, 24 hours, they peak, but by 96 hours, they disappear. So where do they go? Well, they differentiate into the intermediate population and subsequently into the low population. And the low population I've only shown out to 168 hours here, but they last for around eight to 10 days. And what I really want you to take home from this is there is no difference between the red and the black bar, i.e. in cancer, the release is exactly the same and the survival is exactly the same. So this is not being affected. Finally, and probably most interestingly for everyone in the room, is are these blood monocytes actually transcriptionally altered in our mouse model? So first of all, we, we needed to check um, that we could use Lysic C high and also Tremel, another marker we used, to actually isolate the correct populations. Um, and so we did single cell seek. So each heat map you see here is actually a mouse. Um, and what, the reason I've included all the heat maps, which is slightly unusual rather than just showing you a ts &E plot, is what I want you to, to kind of take home is that there are no new populations. So we can still segregate these populations using our traditional markers. There are some discrete changes and we are looking into them, but essentially there's no new populations that form in cancer. So this was kind of, um, nice because we didn't really care what the outcome of this experiment was. If there were new populations, that was really cool and we could probably publish that. And if there weren't, I could proceed to sort normally with everything we had set up. So again, a nice, a nice kind of experiment and with some interesting genes that we're looking into at the moment. So we proceeded then to um, do bulk sequencing, which we can get much deeper reads. Obviously the single cell was around 5,000 genes. And first of all, we just screened. Um, so we did around 10 million reads in all four of these populations in both cancer and in wild type. And we did multiple comparisons looking for any differences and differential gene expression. And what really came forward from that was it's this Lysic C high population in the blood that are affected. And this was really good because, as I said before, this was the population that we were expecting to be changed when we did the kinetic. And it's also really interesting because while we have the blood data in humans, it's not very easy to take bone samples from non-metastatic breast cancer and early breast cancer patients. Um, so what we showed here is that actually it's not occurring in the bone. And so whatever conditioning and transcriptional changes that are occurring are occurring in the blood due to a blood signal. Um, whether that's tumor exosomes, we, we don't know, um, but it's certainly occurring in the blood. So I'm just gonna focus on some of the changes in these Lysic C high and show a very simple um, heat map here. And <clears throat> what I want you to, to take away from this is that there's a predominant down regulation of genes in these Lysic C high cells in cancer. So the bottom right chunk of blue, that's all down regulated genes in cancer. And I'm really sorry that I can't show you the different genes and discuss them, but they're linked to our human work, which has um, a patent on it. So yeah, I can't. But what I can tell you is that what was really interesting is the pathways, so I'll go on to explain those. But also we saw some um, changes in, um, in some epigenetic transcriptional signatures as well. 
So um, what do we see when we do the pathway analysis? Well, yeah, there was a little bit of upregulation, but as you might have noticed in the heat map, that wasn't consistent across all three samples. But, uh, but what we do see is a huge downregulation in general interferon signaling and response. And if you take into account that this is metascape, so this is not a cell-specific pathway analysis, so we would already not expect to see interferon downregulated, and then we see it even further downregulated. So a Q log Q value of minus 32, it's pretty, um, pretty kicking. Um, so why is that interesting and biologically relevant? Well, interferon, as we all know, is um, nasty to cancer. It doesn't like it. And these are the cells that are supposed to be potentially fighting cancer. And here we see a direct downregulation of those anti-cancer pathways. So at this point, I'd just like to return to this phenomena. And what we've seen in these mice is certainly there is this pro-cancerous shift. So how can we use this? Well, how do we apply pressure to these pro-cancer cells to then tilt the balance? And there's been a few um, substances and such like mentioned um, during this meeting. And the exciting thing is recently these epigenetic modifiers. So we've had JQ1 mentioned, um, but also um, more recently in mice, um, HDAC inhibitors have been shown really nicely to um, remodel the epigenetic environment of these cells and cause a transition from this pro-cancerous phenotype to an anti-cancerous phenotype. And this is only in mouse mod models so far, but we have shown that there is a, a, a shift and um, reduced metastases and tumor burden. Um, so we're, we're liberating these cells and using them to actually fight the cancer. Um, where do we go forward from this? Well, as we've also had mentioned, a lot of these um, drugs are not very specific, so they have terrible side effects. So the key is really to try and target these, and that's why monocytes, again, are, are quite, quite nice, because we can actually develop more specific targeted therapy in terms of delivering these monocytes directly into the bloodstream, as has, has been done with dendritic cells. So I just want to summarize by saying that um, in the last... Um, in the last year, in the, well, the first year of my PhD, we've characterized the kinetics of monocytes in a spontaneous mouse model of breast cancer. The, the monocytes in our mouse model did show a transcriptional alteration, and there's a pro-cancerous shift. And that disentangling this really may lead to identification of therapeutic targets. And I've just about got time. Um, I haven't spoken about this today, but we are um, now looking into um, the epigenetic uh, landscape as well, using ATTAC and ChIP-seq um, in our human samples, but I haven't had time to talk about that today. Um, finally, I'd like to say a big thank you. Um, my primary supervisor, Professor Jeffrey Pollard, is a huge body of knowledge and always hugely impressive. Um, Steve Jenkins, my secondary supervisor, is um, a master at flow cytometry and just general knowledge of science. And um, finally, to Professor Chris Glass, who is based at UCSD and kindly hosted me, um, which meant I got to stay in San Diego, which was amazing. Um, and the, the numerous people there who've helped me to learn some complex epigenetic techniques and moreover, the um, patience they've had with teaching me the bioinformatics. Thank you very much.